Okay, good. Thanks. So, uh, yeah, as uh, I did plan to be there in person and to not only deliver my presentation, actually, too, but also meet uh, a couple of people. Well, not a couple, actually, quite a lot uh, since I've been missing all these events uh, since COVID times. But okay, situation changes, and so uh, luckily I was able to do that with that way. Anyways, uh, so uh, again, hello everybody. My name is uh, Alexi Brodkin, and so uh, today we are going to talk about uh, POSIX in uh, Zephyr Artos. Hopefully, you'll find that presentation interesting of some use for you. So uh, uh, let me briefly introduce myself uh, so that uh, you may understand so where I came from. So uh, I've been involved in uh, Zephyr Artos development for more than five years now. Uh, primarily, uh, that whole development happens around our course uh, because I work for Synopsys, uh, uh, which has that own uh, processor architecture and uh, that's what we support. Uh, before diving into Zephyr, I was working for uh, I'm uh, working on uh, other open source projects like Linux kernel, various build systems, namely Buildroot, Open Embedded, uh, the works cursions to UC Libc and other things. Uh, but these days I mostly review arc related code in Zephyr and uh, participate in technical and uh, not very technical discussions about Zephyr. And so uh, that's what I do in Synopsis as well. So I lead that uh, uh, team of uh, um, uh, software developers which work on Zephyr, again, uh, mostly focused around arc processors. And so I think we are quite successful, and I may say that support for ARC processors in Zephyr is possibly uh, one of the best, uh, at least on par with other major architectures and much better than uh, something else, because we we really care and so that's of our interest uh, to be uh, in a very good uh, situation here. Uh, and uh, uh, for several years, I've been uh, uh, wearing a page of Zenop, uh, Zephyr ambassador, uh, as I've been talking on different conferences, uh, promoting Zephyr both uh, in the uh, open source community and between uh, among our customers and even uh, among our internal users in the company. So hopefully it was not given to me for free. Now, what we are going to talk uh, today, uh, we'll start from introduction uh, to the Zephyr, Artos, and POSIX so that we are on the same page and better understand what uh, those substances really are. Uh, then we'll see how those uh, two substances blend uh, into each other. And uh, finally, uh, uh, we'll try to understand what does it really mean for developers of applications on top of Zephyr RTOS, or even in a more generic case, how knowledge about uh, POSIX support in Zephyr RTOS might help uh, product developers. Uh, now, uh, zooming into the first introductory part, uh, very short on what uh, uh, Zephyr is. I hope that most of you already uh, aware of that and familiar to some extent with that thing because you are attending that uh, Zephyr part of uh, that open source conference. And uh, then we'll see what, what is POSIX actually uh, and uh, what it has to do in context of uh, embedded systems. Um, that slide I shamelessly uh, taken from the from so-called uh, Zephyr Golden Deck. I think it is maintained primarily by Kate, by uh, but other people also uh, contribute a lot. Uh, that's a reference slide deck which is maintained by uh, Zephyr Project, as I said, by multiple people contributing, and give uh, that gives you a kind of high-level overview. And so likely you have seen that already uh, today or previously, uh, but still that gives a, a good uh, good pitch on some key uh, benefits of Zephyr Artos. Uh, here's yet another borrowed slide from uh, the same deck, but uh, copied here on uh, purpose, not just uh, uh, as, as the previous one. Uh, with it, I wanted to highlight the fact that there are a lot of things available in Zephyr Artos today and so more will be added. You may see you have uh, BSPs, uh, device drivers, but also complex software stacks like TCP IP, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, and uh, much more on top of that. But, uh, and from one point of view, it gives developers so many tools and possibilities, but on the other hand, well, uh, as some people used to say, there is enough road, a rope uh, to shoot yourself in the foot. So with high complexity, uh, it's uh, not easy to deal with. And uh, uh, so what we can offer for managing that complexity, and uh, I would say, okay, as uh, software, as we as a software developers, what we, uh, how we solve these problems, we just yet another layer of, of abstraction. And so, so uh, which brings us to the uh, POSIX discussion. Uh, so 
a couple of basic facts. So uh, that name POSIX uh, uh, was suggested by Richard Stallman and uh, is nothing else but uh, an acronym for Portable Operating System Interface. While X came from the, those Unix days and it was very popular as well, which gives us uh, the POSIX. And um, uh, it was just a standard so, or attempt to standardize interface between different versions of uh, Unixes. Uh, and uh, all the it originated uh, uh, originally referred to the uh, IEEE standards uh, 1003.1. Uh, uh, the name POSIX uh, uh, more correctly refers to a family of related standards because you may have IEEE uh, 3000, uh, 1003 n where that's n might be one, two, three, four, and so uh, quite a lot of those. And uh, part of uh, ISO, uh, which is also uh, uh, sometimes mentioned there, uh, comes from that uh, International Organization for Standardization. Uh, much later, POSIX.13, uh, that's exactly that's 1003.13 uh, standard, was developed as a subset of uh, POSIX uh, 1, which is supposed to be much more uh, applicable to embedded systems uh, compared to the fully featured uh, elder brother. Uh, and uh, uh, we may know that the first ver version of uh, POSIX 1 standard was developed in uh, 1988, while the most recent version of it is dated uh, 2018, which means uh, it is pretty alive and uh, still being worked on. Uh, another interesting note, we are talking about the set of documents, and so uh, I have more complete, uh, a complete list of uh, those uh, basic POSIX standards in the backup section in the end for those who is really curious. Uh, so we are talking about uh, tens of thousands of pages. So that's quite a big standard and uh, it's not easy to implement everything. Only POSIX.1, that uh, um, generic part of the standards of, is about 4,000 pages. So you may already see uh, where we are going, right? Uh, still, what is very important uh, uh, for us embedded developers uh, is POSIX uh, one standard specifies application programming interface uh, or API or set of APIs at the source level. And so that's that means it's about source code portability. That's not about binary portability or compatibility. And that's fine. That's what we need in, in embedded world. So uh, what are those APIs provided by POSIX? Uh, you may easily guess so uh, some very, uh, very, very straightforward stuff like p uh, and uh, other things, right? But apparently also there are some IO functions like open, close and all that. But on top of that, or uh, also with that, so you have very basic functionality, which is uh, part of C standards or C runtime as well. Uh, that's exactly uh, what it meant to specify. Uh, so now speaking about POSIX in context of embedded systems. Uh, as I said, was, what is important in case of embedded software, not binary compatibility, but uh, uh, source code portability, uh, so that you may basically recompile your source for different platforms and uh, reuse your existing code. And in that sense, uh, uh, when your application implements everything yourself itself, uh, and not relying on external libraries or services, uh, there is definitely not, uh, there is no need for POSIX. And that kind of software might be portable, though not necessarily, and uh, it requires proper approach for uh, to coding things, right? It is not that easy as uh, some of you may know. But with increasingly complex software, even for a deeply embedded solutions, it becomes not very practical practical to develop everything from uh, scratch because, well, this is very time consuming. And uh, so uh, uh, we want to try to reuse existing components. And so those created by us for previous projects and those uh, which were made by others. We most likely will use uh, C runtime, uh, which comes from your tool chain uh, usually, but sometimes from your operating system as well. Drivers, software stacks, abstract abstraction layers, uh, and so on. And so that basically means uh, portability of our entire project depends on uh, uh, many more components. Uh, what else? Uh, you have uh, uh, also uh, SOC vendors, uh, which may provide you some uh, base, uh, base support software. So it might be BSP, or it might be some driver sense. Uh, uh, very often you may get uh, just one solution, like one vendor will provide you BSP for Linux, another for three RTOS, another for uh, some other RTOS. And that's why 
you either need to have multiple implementations for uh, each of these SOCs of your uh, business logic, or you may basically recompile if you have that compatibility layer in place. And another interesting use case, uh, which is uh, worth mentioning, that's uh, application of your full featured powerful uh, x86 host or ARM host these days, where you have a lot of things like uh, Valgrind for uh, finding memory leaks and everything, Linux perf uh, for proper profiling. And then uh, once you're ready with your business logic, you just recompile that for your uh, tiny embedded target and you don't need to debug there. Uh, and here on the left, I intentionally put all these logos. Uh, so these are operating systems, uh, which at least to some extent support POSIX. So you may see if you have a proper supports or enough support of POSIX on uh, each of those, or at least some of those are tosses and your software uses POSIX uh, or relies on that, uh, uh, quite likely you, you'll be able to move from one RTOS to another, which provides you that abstraction of your platform. And so you may easily migrate from one platform to another. Okay, uh, so uh, speaking about uh, uh, real-time and embedded application support. So as I mentioned, this is uh, that IEEE uh, 1003.13 standards and its latest version was uh, published in 2003. And it specifies uh, something called uh, real-time system profiles for, from uh, PSE 51 to uh, 54. Uh, so as we learned already, the POSIX standard is huge and initially was developed by uh, big Unix workstations. But uh, most likely, uh, not everything which was uh, meant to be used on these bigger machines is applicable to embedded systems. And with that in mind, a subset of the POSIX one uh, was created, which is called POSIX 13. And so uh, it exactly uh, tries to cater to embedded application support. Uh, POSIX 13 uh, depends, uh, describes real-time uh, environment profiles, uh, so-called PSE5X, uh, with some numbers there, starting from minimal real-time profile PSE51 up to the multi-purpose real-time uh, PSE54. Uh, know that in, in reality, there are uh, way more differences compared to uh, what will be uh, depicted uh, now. So the simplest PSE51 profile is meant to be used on very small embedded devices with single processor and some kind of memory, likely on chip SRAM. For example, sensors or control devices which require no user interactions uh, fall into that category. Still, it allows for using P threads uh, likely mapped onto the uh, underlying RTOS tasks. Uh, signals and uh, for communication between threads and also relies on C library, obviously, for providing uh, compliant uh, basic primitives. And uh, we'll talk about C libraries in a moment. Uh, then on top of that, there is PSC52, which extends uh, PSC51 with simple file systems such as RAM disk or flash memory and message queues. At the same time, there is no re additional requirements for underlying hardware. It's only uh, that provides you uh, a, bit, a little bit richer uh, software functionality. It could be used on the same systems as uh, PSC51 uh, uh, pictured uh, previously or below. Uh, then what we have uh, uh, PS in PSE 53, uh, which differs significantly because it introduces concepts of uh, multiple processes, uh, which are basically isolated from each, uh, which are uh, those uh, execution units which are isolated from each other by hardware. And so those we are talking about uh, use of MMU uh, on a single core system or or in addition to that, we may have SMP system, or which stands for symmetric multiprocessor. And so it's no longer usable on the same simple hardware as previously discussed profiles. Uh, also, there are finally uh, networking capabilities. Uh, so we may uh, talk uh, about some kind of IoT device, uh, for example, some edge device which communicates and uh, talks to its cloud uh, counter counterpart. And on the top of the list, uh, there is PSC54 profile, which is good for very complex devices. We may have shells, displays uh, for user interaction, and uh, we may even have multiple users. Uh, so that and full featured storage, uh, but uh, uh, that's for kind of high end embedded devices. And in that sense, you may even think about embedded Linux. So why bother uh, in case of uh, Artos or something? So uh, that was an overview of Zephyr and POSIX as uh, two separate substances. Now let's try to mix them together and see what we get out of that. Uh, we'll start from historical overview on, uh, to demonstrate uh, some milestones in POSIX development in Zephyr, and then we'll briefly touch on the current state of POSIX uh, supporting Zephyr RTOS. 
uh, still, I would strongly encourage you guys, uh, girls, to go or visit uh, another presentation, which is going to happen today, made by uh, Chris Fitt. Uh, and uh, uh, Fritz, and uh, he'll be talking in much more details of the current state and much more finer technical details. Uh, so as you may see, uh, uh, so now we, when we started discussing history, uh, first admission to POSIX uh, around POSIX uh, landed in Zephyr in 2017, which was only a year and a half uh, since the first release of Zephyr. So which means uh, even back in the day, there was some demand and interest. Uh, one thing I'd like to mention in particular, so-called native POSIX board, which was also introduced in the very beginning. Uh, basically, that's a lightweight translation layer between Zeph APIs and POSIX compliant host. In our case, uh, Linux distro on your development machine. And so uh, you may think about that as uh, Wine on Linux or WSL, uh, Windows subsystem for Linux of the first version on Windows. If we have time at the end of that presentation, I have a backup slide uh, with some more information on that. Uh, another noticeable item is uh, Civet web uh, application, but we'll discuss that uh, just in a second. And uh, what's also I may uh, tell that now uh, uh, 2023 seems to be a year of POSIX in Zephyr. Again, uh, because of our current maintainer, uh, Chris, uh, has a very systematic approach and so uh, he contributes a lot of fixes and improvements as well as uh, he has a nice and detailed ro roadmap. Uh, that said, you are more than welcome to contribute as uh, so there is a lot of work ahead of us in that area. And on the right now, you may see a list of people who significantly contributed over time uh, to that uh, uh, part of Zephyr development. So these are maintainers which uh, used to be in the project and Chris is now uh, the last one in the active. Uh, so uh, you see uh, over time a lot uh, was done. Actually, these are not only changes which I have here, but these are only milestones I wanted to highlight. Okay, uh, so it was history, but uh, what do we have today? Uh, if we look at the official uh, Zephyr documentation about POSIX support, uh, and you may get there by the link in the bottom once you have these slides available, you'll see that block diagram uh, in the beginning. Uh, and you may immediately see those POSIX system profiles, which we discussed a couple of uh, slides ago. So you may see PSE 51, 52, 53, Unfortunately, that does not really mean that all of them, or at least the simplest PSE 51, are fully supporting Zephyr today. Uh, and I will remind you that the real, uh, real full scope of these aforementioned profiles uh, are rather big. So even though uh, there is a conformance test provided by the Open Group Consortium uh, for each of those profiles, I doubt there are many uh, implementations uh, of POSIX that are usually uh, that are actually fully compliant. And uh, even if those uh, exist, uh, um, probably it's not what you want in your embedded uh, system because uh, it will uh, obviously uh, consume a lot of memory and possibly won't be that efficient. And in the sense of Zephyr, it's not uh, uh, unique in the sense that uh, we don't strictly follow standard, but rather we enable features uh, uh, which are really needed for some particular development. Uh, still, uh, from that diagram, you may get uh, some idea. As we saw earlier, uh, PSE 51 is bare minimum profile, and uh, then if we add something like file system to it, we all, it already looks kind of uh, uh, similar to uh, what PSE 52 uh, is meant to be. And on top of that, we enable networking uh, and uh, um, think here about uh, BSD sockets, which is very nice uh, programming abstraction for uh, data exchange between host over network. Uh, so then you add MMU and SMP, and then it is something very similar to PSC 53, right? Uh, what we don't mention here is PSC 54, because, well, that's a little bit too much, uh, in my opinion, though maybe at some point when we add uh, multi-user capabilities in Zephyr, uh, it will be already somewhere there. Uh, at this point, we also don't have uh, complicated file systems. I think only FATS and uh, something uh, reasonably uh, simple as well. Anyways, uh, below that diagram, if you can uh, go and visit that page, uh, you will see uh, uh, quite a long list of functions already supported and not yet supported. And that is actually, uh, I would say, a more realistic view on uh, uh, POSIX support in Zephyr, though it is not exhaustively complete, because it's not only uh, a certain amount of functions, but uh, uh, 
uh, all the peculiarities about their attributes, uh, their parameters, and so some other things which we are going to talk a little bit more uh, on the next slide. And so uh, basically what you will see in that list, uh, maybe something I tried to capture here. So uh, you, um, in Zephyr, you don't, we don't really care at least at this point about uh, uh, compliance with those uh, official things like PSE something, but uh, we are more focused again on something which allows you to do uh, some real things to implement uh, real uh, APIs. And so that's why what is what might be more important for you go and check uh, which primitives or which functions are already supported, rather than just saying okay if a PSC something is supported or not. Okay. Uh, so uh, okay. So now let's uh, I'll talk a little bit uh, about uh, limitations uh, and differences from traditional POSIX. Uh, so even though a lot is already in place for reasonably good POSIX support in Zephyr RTOS, uh, there are still things uh, to consider and improve. So first of all, uh, Zephyr RTOS has a bunch of its own, uh, its, uh, its very own APIs. Moreover, uh, they uh, keep evolving. We have uh, some interfaces get obsolete, some uh, new interfaces appear, and some uh, just change over time because this is very actively developed project. But with, uh, with very few, uh, but uh, uh, very few, if uh, any at all, were uh, meant to be used specifically for implementation of POSIX functionality. Maybe now we'll start seeing something like that, but uh, before all that, we try to basically uh, uh, map, this, uh, map POSIX on uh, what was already available and then fight you something. Uh, that said, inevitably, there are some uh, uh, translation which happens between POSIX API and Zephyr native APIs, uh, which means uh, there is a little bit more code gets uh, used, uh, uh, more instructions being uh, generated by the compiler, uh, which means you may get a little bit uh, different, possibly a little bit bigger memory footprint and more instructions executed in runtime by your CPU, which may translate to some uh, performance penalty or overhead. Uh, but as always, uh, it is not that uh, black and white. Uh, it does not mean that without POSIX, your application or your implementation will be tiny and fast, and with POSIX, it will be slow and huge. Uh, it might be uh, barely visible that uh, impact of POSIX on your application. And so, so as usual, before jumping to any conclusion, one needs to do proper evaluation, profiling, do measurements and to see if uh, what you get with POSIX, if it is really uh, uh, still okay for you or there is something which you don't want to have. Uh, then as in any good piece of embedded software in Zephyr, we prefer to do uh, static allocations of, uh, to not be surprised later on uh, by an expected overutilization of precious resources, such as memory, for example, uh, because we typically don't have gigabytes of RAM uh, on embedded devices as opposed to modern laptops, smartphones, and even smartwatches sometimes. Uh, and, uh, so uh, we, we want to be, and also for from a certification standpoint, which is also important for Zephyr, well, we don't want uh, to use uh, dynamic allocations because then you barely can certify uh, any safety critical system. Uh, but apparently uh, uh, it is pretty typical to use uh, to just randomly create new threads and other objects in runtime because, well, it is so convenient for us developers and hide some complexity. And apparently people use that widely. Uh, those we need to enable that functionality in Zephyr, which didn't exist again with good justification. And people is not happy uh, when we start talking about uh, dynamic locations uh, in that kind of embedded software. And so this is now work in progress uh, with, uh, so we try to do that carefully so that uh, you may uh, enable that dynamic allocations only if you really want to and so keep using static allocations, but you may uh, escape the dynamic allocation. Uh, so then since POSIX defines a lot of common and standard things like data types, function prototypes, uh, and we already saw those so things like uh, ABS, uh, A2I, and so other things, and so it even defines structure and uh, header names. Uh, so it's not very obvious how to squeeze uh, POSIX headers in the existing Zephyr code base, because Zephyr code base is already quite mature and uh, quite uh, quite uh, quite uh, there are a lot of things there, right? And uh, uh, so it's not easy to squeeze uh, in yet another quite a big substance or blend uh, them together because they might be clashes. 
uh, moreover, as I mentioned, uh, initially edit functions were uh, introduced uh, in kind of random manner, and so their definitions need to be moved uh, in uh, some other places so that we have uh, so that we follow those requirements uh, imposed by uh, POSIX as well. Uh, and as we saw just now, there are a, a lot of components specif uh, specified uh, uh, even by PSC uh, 51. Uh, and even if uh, minor and simple functions uh, and our bigger goal to be uh, compliant, so, so that the uh, wide range of existing code could be simply uh, compiled uh, as a replication. For that, uh, we'll need to implement missing functions. Uh, and again, as we discussed, POSIX is not something uh, completely new. Instead, it is a, it's an attempt to standardize uh, uh, based, uh, standardized, uh, standardize uh, based on what was already in place. And so some of existing functions uh, will, uh, will require adjustments as well. Uh, speaking about C libraries in context of POSIX, it's a very good separate topic uh, and worth probably a separate session. Uh, because significant parts of POSIX relies on uh, what is provided by uh, C runtime, by uh, C library. And at the same time, most of C libraries, uh, especially those uh, which are part of RTOSIS and uh, Zephyr, for example, also has its own minimal C library implementation. So uh, they uh, themselves don't provide everything required by POSIX. What's worse, uh, some C libraries may have their own definitions of types and functions which clash with POSIX definitions. And in that sense, uh, well, we have new lib, uh, which seems to be the lowest hanging fruit because it uh, was in the originally written to be compliant with POSIX. And uh, yet there might be some subtle issues. In case of uh, C runtime, which comes from your proprietary tool chains, it's clear that uh, there are lots of complications are uh, waiting for us. Uh, and uh, some of these things could be easily solved, and we did solve that uh, for some of our uh, for our proprietary tool chain. Uh, also, not everything, but uh, we just started to work on that. But uh, there might be some things uh, which will be very hard to fix. Oh, and uh, uh, things like uh, sysconf uh, don't exist in Zephyr these days. And uh, that is a very tiny utility which allows to get information about properties of the system. Uh, so like it's software and hardware features and states in the runtime uh, so that you may uh, not rely from some on something which is hard coded during your configuration, but you may use uh, um, obtain the data when you need that. And again, this is now work in progress. And so uh, there is a good discussion uh, going on like how to do that so that we don't uh, do everything in right time something possibly could be uh, obtained from uh, during build time uh, via some constants uh, so that we don't blow the code and we are efficient still because we are still we are talking about embedded software uh, now uh, one uh, one uh, since we are uh, pretty much done uh, with a lot of theory let's look at uh, how that could be used in something real and so we will discuss two cases uh, one tightly integrates application uh, which will be civet web and uh, then porting a new uh, let's call it random application which relies on POSIX internal okay so uh, here's an example of uh, how uh, it used to work some time ago Literally, uh, once your Zephyr build environment is ready, just execute two commands. Uh, the first you may see that's on top west build uh, uh, and path to that example uh, will build you uh, that example. And the second uh, command west build minus uh, target run will execute that. Right. And so, uh, well, it's uh, very nice. So uh, once you connect to that, uh, to that uh, um, uh, embedded target, which in my case was just chemo, uh, you may see that's okay. Th there, there is an ordin ordinary uh, web server which may uh, give you some data. Right. So uh, it is all uh, nice. Uh, and so now let's look a little bit uh, closer. So, what is that? Uh, um, so that Civet Web it is a uh, web server uh, which is meant to be used on embedded devices. And one might argue that okay, web server is not that uh, common embedded, uh, not common for embedded systems. But uh, I would say definitely there are reasonable use cases. Uh, one good example, which I know from my experience, uh, that's an interface for configuration or exploring logs, for example. So you don't need to have any other way uh, to obtain data from that device or submit uh, some configuration. You may even do that in an automated way because you. Will submit some JSON, for example. Um, uh, so, uh, 
Also, why I find that particular example uh, to be a very good uh, uh, thing to discuss here during that presentation, because uh, it is uh, actually very complex uh, third party application and uh, it uses exactly a lot of POSIX API. And in fact, it became a test vehicle of a kind for getting some of those APIs polished and improved uh, or even implemented in Zephyr. Uh, and as I said, uh, it was exactly like that. Somebody got an itch and started to scratch it, uh, which gave us quite a good result of much improved uh, Zephyr uh, functionality in, uh, in uh, uh, POSIX functionality, sorry, in Zephyr. Um, and uh, uh, another thing which uh, I have to mention, well, uh, unfortunately, that very nice example got removed from Zephyr some time ago, uh, because again, it was quite a complex uh, third party project and it required some maintenance because with the uh, involvement of Zephyr and uh, um, new uh, vulnerabilities uh, found in different parts or different sub projects used by Steven Web, we'd like to see uh, a person who will be uh, in charge of that and will work on improvements even on uh, CVET uh, side, not only on Zephyr side, but uh, apparently nobody was really interested. Uh, and, uh, and that's why it would, got removed in uh, Zephyr version uh, 3.2, which was two version uh, before. Now we are in 3.4. Uh, but what is good, uh, actually, there is quite some interest in uh, functionality like that, and so uh, there is ongoing discussion, and hopefully during uh, Google Summer of Code, uh, replacements will be uh, developed or will start the development, and so we'll have something like that, but uh, more tight and integrated with Zephyr, and so we'll see, hopefully, uh, it materializes sometime soon. Uh, and so on the, in the uh, bottom right corner, you may see that uh, a nice animal. This is exactly that civet or vivera. That's a mammal from uh, subtropical and tropical countries so, uh, such as Africa and, uh, of Africa and Asia. Uh, so that's just a funny uh, fact. And now speaking about example, which was that random uh, third party example, which was never integrated with Zephyr whatsoever. And so uh, for some, it might be uh, something uh, pretty well known, uh, core mark, at least that's uh, previous or older version uh, uh, is kind of industry standard for benchmarking, benchmarking of embedded targets. By, but I intentionally uh, decided to, uh, to work on uh, core mark pro because it utilizes something called uh, MITH, MITH, which stands for multi-instance test harness. And for that multi-instance, they actually decided to use uh, pthread. And so that gives you or gave me that uh, nice sample, which might be useful uh, and so possibly even used for benchmarking if prepared uh, and polished in the right way. Uh, still, it will be uh, easily ported on top of Zephyr as just uh, that uh, vehicle which provides you different threads. Moreover, frankly, my intention was to showcase how SMP system uh, might benefit uh, execution of your project, because then with uh, SMP support, uh, we'll be able to uh, execute those separate instances of core mark on different cores and uh, uh, demonstrate very, very nice uh, uh, efficiency uh, scaling because you have like 20 cores and you get uh, the same set of uh, things that get executed uh, 20 times faster. So uh, even though uh, that thing does not work or does not compile uh, as an as an application uh, on top of Zephyr out, out of the box because uh, it was never prepared like that and we need to do some plumbing, but if uh, we go and look at the documentation with, which explains uh, how to integrate freestanding application with Zephyr, we may actually easily do that. Because uh, for that, what we need to do, we just need to introduce uh, a, a couple of uh, additional files uh, to instruct CMake build system of Zephyr, what we actually need to build and how to do that. And then we add uh, uh, some, uh, uh, some configurations options, uh, which will be, uh, which will accommodate uh, things which which are actually used in that project. Okay, so uh, then uh, let's switch uh, to the next slide and see what we actually need to do. I hope you may uh, uh, see on uh, in a projection of uh, uh, my slides uh, something. I was told that possibly that background might uh, blend with uh, content a little bit. Comments are not that important, but uh, I hope uh, otherwise something which is not commented out uh, is visible to you.
So uh, that's actually quite some, uh, or not quite some, some boilerplate, uh, which is typical for Zephyr. Uh, so these are first three lines. Uh, so we say which version of CMake uh, we have to use, or at least what is the latest, uh, what is the minimal version which we need to use. And so then we add a really boilerplate and so then uh, project uh, stuff. And then we simply start to add uh, our source files, uh, which we want uh, uh, CMake uh, built infrastructure to compile. And so you may see just a couple of lines. And then on top of that, uh, we add just a couple of a uh, uh, couple of uh, substances which are unique to that project because we want to be able to pass some parameters. In case of Zephyr, as with many other embedded uh, systems, there is no such a thing as a command line arguments because, well, you have your uh, remote sensor which is doing something on its own. So how do you expect to pass uh, command line parameters? So that test was meant to be used uh, on to be executed uh, on uh, like bigger systems with uh, IO, and so so we basically will trick that uh, uh, force uh, providing those arguments, and for that we uh, have that definition here. Uh, and what we have in the uh, additional configurations options, exactly what we want. We enabled POSIX API, uh, we enabled pthread IPC, and we enabled clock. Then I had to disable get opt because apparently there is uh, implementation of that in uh, in the uh, test itself. So that's why uh, during build you will see that uh, clash of uh, multiple multiple defined symbols. And so we disabled that. I and I intentionally enabled a new lib uh, SC library because otherwise, by default, that will be minimal libc, which is lacking uh, uh, some of the capabilities which are used in that uh, test. And also, well, uh, in the end, that's a benchmarking uh, um, uh, application. So we want to compile not by default uh, by size, but we do that uh, for speed. And so what I said, we also add that a little bit of instrumentation in the test itself so that we may accommodate that uh, fact that we don't pass arguments and still pass it somehow, okay? And then uh, we, again, with a very simple command line similarly to that uh, uh, web uh, server, and here I even squeeze that into one comment. We say build, uh, uh, we built in that particular folder and then just say run and it's okay. We got it executed and so uh, you see we had four contexts, four workers, or you may have even more. And it will equally uh, well scale on your SMP system and you will see uh, improved uh, execution time, actually shorten that. Because in that case, there is no uh, relation between executed units so that uh, you have 20 of uh, uh, workers or 20 contacts, for example, and they will be scheduled for five cores and then you will have for four times shorter execution time. So that, that was the intention, actually. So I think uh, I'm pretty much uh, done with uh, what I wanted to say uh, in that presentation. And so here I'd like to just summarize that. Uh, so uh, one first thing, uh, Zephyr community has been working on POSIX support for more than five years and a lot was uh, done uh, throughout these years. And so we keep working on that primarily. Uh, Chris is working on that and he's asking for uh, contributions because the, there's a lot of work to do. Uh, at times, the development was more active. At times, only some minor changes were introduced. But uh, most of the time, there was a person or a group of people who was interested in improving uh, POSIX support in Zephyr. And uh, as I said, uh, people start scratching uh, their itches and uh, get those nice improvements. Uh, uh, so we may see that development of POSIX features is really driven by real needs of those who use that in uh, their hobby projects or even in commercial products. Um, uh, what is important for developers for, who already use Zephyr Artos uh, in their project or only thinking about jumping on it is that uh, a lot of POSIX uh, functionality is already available and a lot of things could be done. Uh, and uh, that means that porting libraries and applications which were or originally created for some POSIX uh, uh, compliant systems, uh, they might be uh, very easily re uh, reused here. And again, you may easily uh, jump from one RTOS, uh, which I mentioned previously to our Zephyr, for example, or even probably from Linux to Zephyr RTOS. Uh, and as usual, there are pros and cons of using uh, that yet another abstraction layer. It helps with uh, software portability, but it may cost you something like penalty in performance and memory footprints, though your millage may uh, vary we usually say. And so with that, I'd like to thank you for all the attention and so we'll be happy to, we'll, we'll happy uh, answer your uh, questions if you have any. 
And I think we are right on time, so we don't have a lot of time for backup material and probably just one or two questions. Okay, I'm done with uh, my slides. Uh, again, thank you all. Any questions, if we have time? We have time for probably a quick question or two, depending on the length. Does anyone have okay. any questions? Nope. Alexia, I think everyone in the room is all set, but if they had them, can you tell them how they could get a hold of you or contact you, please? Uh, so uh, there are a couple of uh, things, uh, or a couple of ways. So the simplest one, just uh, uh, you may uh, find me as a contributor in uh, Zephyr GitHub and uh, um, contact there. Or I'm also available on Discord channel. And in the end, uh, uh, I may share my email or probably uh, links for the Asian folks may share it. And so, so you will get it and uh, may contact me that way. Okay. Thank you, guys. Thank you all.